Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, I would say that in the States, um, generally speaking, the way in which people come into contact with someone from a uh, Muslim background is they're either working in a situation where they're working next to someone like that, or oftentimes, and I know a lot of churches do this, they're engaged in ministry um, to students who are on an international yeah. exchange who are in universities, and there are programs that are developed to try and just help them acclimate, very similar to the type of thing that you're doing in Athens. Um, what what advice would you give to people who, I mean, you've been doing this for years now, who are trying to build these relationships with people who are just trying to get culturally located in many ways, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and, and then what advice would you give them, and, and how would you help them think through how to get to know where the person is at, at, on a religious level as well? Hmm. Um. I mean, I suppose obviously the one one of the thing that I would really emphasize is just invite them into your home. You know, have them come over and have a meal. Um, I mean, I've met an awful lot of people who come to America and you know they don't get invited anywhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, and um, you know, so just to have them come and be a part of a family. I mean, they're very very. And that family means a large. lot culturally to just, them. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. You know, just to come and, and be a part of your family and meet your kids and and uh, you know find ways to introduce them, say to other, say to Christian students who are their age, um, and just kind of expose them to different aspects of American culture. Um, you know, and I would say we have to be careful not to be too preachy at the beginning. You mm-hmm. know, more to ask questions, and I mean, basically do what Jesus did and ask a lot of questions mm-hmm. and get you know get them talking. And you know, I I I I would generally find that you know they will be open to talk if they sense that you're willing to listen and not pounce on everything they say. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're saying there's terrific value initially in just letting them kind of tell their story yeah. about where they're oh, from yeah. and who they are and yeah. and and help them and that I I find that actually helps someone uh, get located in in terms of knowing you know maybe there's an experience or something to relate to or something like that that can open up the door for a more meaningful conversation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know there's just a million practical things if you come from another culture. And you're living here, and you just don't know how things work. Mm-hmm. You know where to find this, that, and the other. And just you know, people need a lot of practical help. Mm-hmm. And just you know, whether it's taking the wife shopping mm-hmm. and just explain to her, you know, how do you decide which of these fifty varieties of potato chips to buy? You, know, I mean, you, you come from anywhere else to America, and it's just overwhelming. Yeah. You know, just how do you make the phones work? And I mean, you know, I generally find that most of these guys that I work with. Are technically so far ahead of me, you know. If I mm-hmm. can't make my phone work, I'll grab one of those guys and say, you know, show me. You know, I'm an idiot. Just show me how this works. Uh-huh. And you know, many, many, many of these people are highly educated. They're you know, they're very intelligent people, and, and you know, so just to, to, for them to sense that you're treating them with respect. And you know you're not looking down on them because they come from somewhere else. You know, I, they'll, I think they'll pick that up pretty fast. Hmm. So, um, so tell us uh, when you're obviously traveling through the states now, and, and I imagine just telling people about what you're doing in part. And um, when you go back, uh, what will, will you be doing? More of the same? Uh, when I go back to, to yeah, Athens, to Athens. Yeah, yeah we're going to actually head back um, towards the end of this month. Um, yeah, so I'll be you know continue to meet with this this group that I'm working with in Athens. Uh, I will be traveling into uh, one of the Middle Eastern countries in November again uh, to meet with a number of people. Um, you know, so I, I'm wearing several different hats, and one mm-hmm. one of the hats that I'm wearing right now with this ministry I'm with called Entrust, 
and just, just kind of a, to back it up historically, we were called BEE for years, Biblical Education by Extension. And so, that was primarily into the into the Iron Curtain. Yeah, country, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we started in '79, mm-hmm. uh, and at that time, Sandy and I were with what was called Campus Crusade at the time, right. crew now. But uh, we had come over to work behind the Iron Curtain with Crusade, and then in the late '70s, Crusade and the Navigators, a bunch of other groups, got together and formed this cooperative called BEE. Mm. The whole idea was they couldn't come to us, but we could go to them. So we would travel across the border. And and then eventually, um, when the wall came down, you know, we kind of diversified into different areas. And uh, just... we're not doing extension education anymore. We're mm-hmm. we're able to let, go and live and work where you know where people where people are living. So we eventually changed our name to Entrust. So from Second Timothy two two, just the idea of entrusting what we've learned to others who train huh. others. Um, so and so my my new hat with them is uh, mission mobilization. So basically, I'm here at Dallas Seminary right now. Uh, meeting students and uh, met with a, a couple last night who are very interested in joining with us. Hmm. So basically, we've got you know I think a great concept of leadership training. We've got open doors, we've got uh, invitations, but we don't have enough people. Hmm. And a lot of us that are with us have been around a long time. You mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of miles on our tires. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'm 66 years old. Mm. You know, and I, I, you know, I can maybe do this for another 20 years, but at some point, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and and you know, we are we. A lot of us have been around a while. So one of Sandy's, my my wife and I, one of our goals is to try to. You know, reproduce ourselves and to mm-hmm. you know raise up some younger people who can, you know, go off to places like China or India or the Middle East. Um, so I'm here at on campus right now doing recruiting, and uh, got a chance to speak in chapel yesterday. And we did a um, a seminar on non formal education. I mean, that's kind of our whole bag is to be able to go to a place like India and help develop a training program um, that's Run by locals and something that's that is meeting their needs, not just coming in and you know taking the same approach, say that would work in the West. It may not work all that well. And you know, one of the, one of the things that that makes a seminary um, so uh, um, special is, is this ability to draw on people who are literally ministering around the world, yeah. have them come yeah. and talk about what they're doing, and, and and alongside the students who come from all around the world, and so you get a global. Um, feel for what's going on in the church that that um, some churches pursue, but many churches don't. And so, uh, from that aspect, it's a it's something that that seminaries are able to do. Uh, one one final question: when you when you have someone, and let's assume they're staying in Athens for a while, have you are the are these Muslim believers um, going into Churches, or are they forming their own churches? What's happening with them if they stay long term? Yeah, good question. You know, there's a variety of different things that happen, and for the most part, I have tried to encourage uh, refugees to get involved in a Greek church. And there's you know a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, just kind of to get integrated into the culture. it can also help with getting jobs because they get to know some Greek believers who can maybe help them. And there are uh, there are a number of churches where there are quite a number of refugees uh, uh, in, in the, who attend there. Uh, there's a place called uh, Second Evangelical Church that is doing a, a ministry to um, people from different parts of the Middle East. Mm. And um, there's a staff person who that's his whole – Outreach is is basically trying to get Greeks involved in reaching out to refugees, and you know not to see them as the enemy who's come and invaded their mm-hmm. territory like a Trojan horse, hmm. but to to you know to get Greeks involved in ministering to them. Um, another, the other side of that coin is there are a number of these refugee centers that call themselves a church on Sunday. Hmm. Um, so then the. You know the believers end up in kind of this little refugee ghetto. That's all they know is mm. other people from their their country, 
And, you know, I, I think that's kind of a dead-end street, but there are an awful lot of those situations where, you know, they don't know anybody else. And, you know, the, the average Greek person doesn't want to have anything to do with foreigners, but, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. a number of believers are starting to reach out. But there is, you know, there's a lot of right-wing backlash right now. I mean, there's mm-hmm. this, this party called Golden Dawn, which is sort of a neo-Nazi group. And, uh, you know, these guys are going around beating people up and, and oh, you, know, wow. cause, you know, so, the, 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 you know, one of the dangers for refugees in, like, even going to church in certain locations, they're afraid because they don't have the right documents. If they venture into this neighborhood to go to church, they just might, the police might want to see their documents and they end up getting arrested and thrown in jail for a while. Hmm. So that you know, they live with a lot of fears that, you know, someone in America has a hard time relating to. But, you know, to me well, and and like one of the, the the guys that I've worked with really closely has been heavily involved in uh, First Evangelical Church, which is a, you know, really solid Bible teaching church and so there, you know, there are a number of these Greek churches that they're involved in. Some of them come to international churches that are English-speaking churches, mm-hmm. and there's actually quite a few of those. And uh, like one of the guys that I've worked with, who is just a dear brother and a, a committed evangelist, really wants to go to an international church because ultimately he wants to go to Vancouver or somewhere, mm-hmm. and, and so that speaking English and learning English is, is to his advantage, and he wants to have fellowship with international people. So, you know, there's kind of all all different options. Well, I take it that you found this work uh, fascinating and and uh, and encouraging in a lot of ways. I imagine it's quite something to to uh, to to either um, be involved in helping to lead someone to the Lord who comes out of Islamic background, or to take someone who's just come to the Lord and watch them grow in the faith. Yeah, it has been you know interesting would be a good word. Mm-hmm. A lot of encouragement, a lot of discouragement along the way. I mm-hmm. mean, there have been times when. You know, it seems like there's sort of a cycle. Every three or four years, there's some kind of a major blow-up that happens. Mm. You know, and there's it's usually some personality conflict. Something happens where, you know, things are going really well, and all of a sudden, it's just like you know somebody pulls a rug out from under the ministry, and then you're starting over again. It's a little mm. bit like being a basketball coach, mm. and you know, you're just getting going well, and then your top guys graduate or they get drafted in the NBA, so then you're starting over again. Mm. So you know, there there have been frustrations and challenges, but, you know, just to see – one of the analogies that I use is I, I feel I'm a little bit like Nick Boletari, who mm-hmm. runs this tennis academy mm-hmm. in Florida. Now, Nick Boletari never won Wimbledon, never mm-hmm. won the U.S. Open, but he trained Agassi and Sampras and uh, Jim uh, Courier and a bunch of those guys. And to me, there's a joy in working with some of these guys and – Teaching and training and mentoring them, and they can go on and do stuff that I can't do. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I mean, they're evangelizing their countrymen in a way that you know that I I'm just not gifted to do. Basically, mm-hmm. I'm a Bible teacher and a mentor, mm-hmm. and I get to coach these guys, and they you know they get to go on and do stuff that's beyond you know mm-hmm. beyond what I can do. And then to see them go on to other places and start up ministries there. Um, you know that 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 that's fun, and you know, like a few years ago, I had a guy that I was working with really closely. His name was Muhammad. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was always cool to be able to read the Bible and pray to Jesus with a guy named Muhammad. <laughs> uh, you know, we've heard about your ministry, and we've uh, even did a little bit of a sign off, uh, and then you shared with me some statistics about uh, the Muslim makeup of countries in Europe and, in, and surrounding Europe, which I thought were just so fascinating that people ought to hear this because I don't think they're aware of kind of where we are and where we may be going. So, uh, Dwight, I'll ask you to just uh, read off some of the statistical information you have about the uh, percentage of Muslim population in Europe and in some of the surrounding countries. Okay. Yeah, I've just been doing some reading online recently and come across you know, a number of statistics, and obviously people are going to have different projections, but one of them that I read – um, just recently saying that at currently about 5% of the population in the European Union identifies themselves as Muslims. And then they said the UN estimates that Europe will be 55% Muslim by 
the year 2040. Now, that's because um, Europeans tend not to have very many children, whereas right. Muslims do. Is that is Yeah, that... I'd say maybe the average Western European has about two-thirds of a child or oh, something wow. per marriage. <laughs> that's I interesting. Mean, you know. <laughs> I don't know quite how you do that, but no, I'll let you yeah. figure that out for me. Well, them. you know, they can do a lot in Europe. Yeah, that's right. But, but, you know, they, so the population in, you know, I think in probably every Western European country of the – ethnic people from that country is going down. It's mm -hmm. getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the the people coming up from the Middle East and North Africa, particularly to places like France, they have a very high birth rate. Mm -hmm. And you've got more and more people just pouring in. I mean, right. You know, so you got the combination of immigration and birth. Right. Is, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like, you know, when I lived in Vienna in the seventies I didn't see anyone from the Middle East, but now when I'm back in Vienna, I mean, I'm just there. Are areas where you just everyone you see is either from the Middle East or from Pakistan or from North Africa. So they, you know, there's this migration that is coming mm -hmm. there. So um, and and you know, like Germany right now is just under four uh, percent. I was surprised to see that Switzerland is about four percent uh, Muslim. You know, you've got a few of these countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina and and Albania that have a much higher percentage. But like France, uh, they're saying is 10% right mm -hmm. now, and of course, growing you know, at a fairly rapid and rate. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, in Albania, how large is the population there, the percentage of? Uh, the percentage in Albania is 70% mm -hmm. Muslim. Hmm. Uh, and Bosnia, Herzegovina was uh, is 40% right now. Um, so it's quite a range. It can go yeah. from a very small minority to a very yeah. Yeah. Uh, almost uh, a plurality or something like oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in, in Bosnia, it was. Uh, I, I'm sorry, um, Kosovo was almost ninety percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course that. Yeah. that would do anyone right. who's familiar with the history right. there knows what's going on. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it it. I think that's an interesting. Uh, backdrop to put into what's going on and, and why this kind of ministry that you're engaged in is so potentially important, because there is going to be an increasing presence of um, of uh, Islamic people in Europe, and that certainly is going to impact uh, the international scene in a yeah. significant way, yeah. and it's, that's worth worth knowing about. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're willing to come back and give us this little, <laughs> sure. uh, this little postscript, little, little footnote, yeah, yeah. footnote yeah. to our yeah. to our podcast. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Dwight. Sure, and and I'll just mention too that there are organizations that are working all over Western Europe, you know, ministering to refugees, and there is sort, you know, somewhat of a network of of, of people who are connected together. So like let's say somebody meets the Lord in Athens and we know they're they're going to Frankfurt. We'll f try to find ways to connect them to people who are ministering up there. Um, there's been a thing called the Refugee Highway Partnership where th the goal has been to try to, you know, link different organizations like that. And that, that you know, that's functioning to some degree. Hmm. That's interesting. So 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 it isn't just in trust. There's a whole Oh, yeah. There's uh, you know, uh, international teams, quite a number of other organizations um, you know, are are focusing and I mean Entrust is a very small organization, and we just have a really, really small niche. But we do, you know, we have contacts with friends in a lot of other places. Um, there are all just, you know, a lot of different organizations that are either run by people from the Middle East or or, or run by Westerners, but are, who are, you know, reaching out to to refugees. Well, again, thank you for no coming harm. in, and the information has been, I'm sure, informative, and it, and it is, it, it pulls back a window on, on what's going on in a part of the world mm -hmm. that oftentimes we don't think about, and it raises the question about, you know, what is God doing in the midst of, in, in the midst of these uh, migratory uh, moves that are changing the makeup of the way we think about the world in certain yeah. parts of the world. We want to thank you, Dwight, for coming yeah. in and talking with us about what your ministry to, uh, to uh, is Islamic uh, believers, I don't know what other phrase to use, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, has been like and, and the ministry. And we just uh, thank you that you're doing what you're doing and, and would pray that, uh, that you're – ministry would bear fruit and that those who you're training will turn out to be able uh, to encourage others to come into the faith. Thank you yeah. for coming in yeah. here today. And we thank you for joining us at the table uh, where God and culture meet, and we hope to uh, see you again uh, next time. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. 
Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.